Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today is another programme in our series on the Enneagram. And today we have three Type 8s in the studio who are going to share what it's like to be a Type 8. And we're going to have a general discussion about Type 8, help you spot whether you are a Type 8 or not, and also look at the potential of being a Type 8. And I have to say on a personal note, this is quite a good programme for me because Type 8s I've often had difficulties with in the past, especially in business. I haven't always found them easy. So let's hope they behave themselves and I, I learn from this as well. So first of all, I'm going to show you some books, which we've all, we had a discussion first to find the most helpful books. These are four books that we've all can recommend. The Enneagram Made Easy, which is a very basic one. The Wisdom of the Enneagram. The Spiritual Dimensions of the Enneagram. And Facets of Unity, the Enneagram of Holy Ideas. Anyway, I'm now going to introduce our guest. So we have Phil, Christine Hello. and Lynn. And Lynn, uh, Christine, I think you're going to start by giving us a brief summary of the Enneagram as how, how you see it and how you were introduced to it. Yeah, sure. Um, the Enneagram is a model of the human condition. It's a psycho-spiritual model, which is at the same time both old and new. The old bit is that it synthesizes and incorporates a lot of um, teachings from Greek philosophers, some of the major religions and mystics. And the new bit is that it's also developed in the last century to incorporate a lot of modern psychological theories and ideas. Um, it's represented by a nine-pointed star, a geometric star, and these nine points represent nine basic personality types or programs that we as human beings have within us. We have all of them, all nine of them, but we tend to hang out in one particular type or domain, a, a default program, if you will, that is our kind of response to how we uh, react to and, 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 and engage with the world. And this default programme covers things like the values that we've developed as individuals, our beliefs, the meanings that we've attached to our experiences through life and our view of the world. And most of this, if not all of this initially, is very unconscious programming. We're not aware of it. Um, and what the Enneagram does and the study of the Enneagram does is it enables you to become aware of that programming and aware of your own beliefs and values and how you view the world. It gives you an opportunity to explore the meanings that you've attached to your life and your life experiences and it helps to create a space for you to interrupt that programming so that you get a choice about whether or not to continue behaving in the way you've always behaved and thinking in the way you've always thought or to have choice and freedom to actually change how you see the world and therefore how you make your way in the world. Um, I first came across the Enneagram when I was trained to be a coach about 10 years ago, just over, but my real direct experience of it came when I trained as a journey therapist and it's a fundamental part of journey therapy training um, and, uh, and continues to be a, one of the main building blocks f for that training. And uh, my experience of knowing that I was an eight came during that training. Good. And how has that impacted your life being an eight? How have, have, what have you learned on a practical basis? Um, well, the first feeling I remember having was a sense of relief because I, a lot of things made sense, started to make sense about looking back on my behaviour and the things that I'd focused my attention on through my adult life. But also with that came a sense of shame because um, some of the darker aspects of the eight personality programming um, are quite difficult to face up to and deal with. Well, that's a great place to start. Mm. So what are some of the darker aspects of the number eight uh, programming? <clears throat> um, I have a tendency in the past, I've been very driven, very driven with my career. Uh, very ambitious, very goal, goal orientated, and um, I know and can recognise that that drive means I can climb over people, walk through people, in a, in getting to my goal, 
that my focus is on my goal and what I want. It's quite ruthless. You can find you're quite ruthless in one way. It, it, it's not a conscious ruthlessness. It's a conscious focus that mm. means you don't see anything else. You just see where you want to go and what you want. Ah. Um, and, and another aspect of that is um, I need to be in control. I need to be in control of my own destiny. Um, I in the past, have not taken kindly to taking orders from other people, particularly if I don't have a sense of a respect or trust for them. So um, those are sort of two of the aspects when I worked in business that I was very aware of um, when I looked back, when I became aware of, of my programming, when I looked back and realised what the part of the game that I'd been playing. Because they do often, a subtitle for their tie page is often the boss, isn't it? Yeah, and I have, through my career, um, ended up in those positions and, um, and, yeah. and deliberately aimed for you know, the next promotion, the next whatever, in order to be in control. OK. So, Phil, let's move on to you. How did you first discover the Enneagram? Well, when I met my wife about 20 years ago, um, I, it was love at first sight for me. And this is with your I, wife or the Enneagram? <laughs> with, with my wife. And, yeah, and, yeah. and what I did was I... I um, very much in love, but we, we had lots of fights. Okay. We, we would just get into big fights. So for my commercial career, I'd done Myers-Briggs sort of training on, on other personality-type issues, so I went, we went on a Myers-Briggs course where the Enneagram was advertised. My wife and I, we didn't get much other Myers Briggs, but we got, we went to the, the Enneagram course, and uh, it was just such a sense of relief for me to see, woof, like my fighting as, a, as an eight was, was something that I was uh, just a personality structure that I was lost in rather than being me. Because the shame that Christine was talking about was awful. When I, when I got into a fight, um, I'd be fighting to win, and then if, when I, if I did win, I'd feel awful. I felt terrible, and it was, it was at work or in relationships. It was, it was just a, a, a dynamic I found myself in, and I got a, a real sense of relief when I, when I heard the Enneagram's way of looking at my personality structure. Mm. So, but how did you change then, or did you change after you, after you understood more about how you worked or your personality worked? How did that affect you on a practical level? On a practical level, I guess that's affected me in lots of ways. And ultimately, I guess I've changed my career because of that, because I've always been the boss. Ever since I'm about early 20s, I've been the boss of whatever operation I was involved in. And I would act out because I would have a very clear focus on what needed to be done, what was the right way to get something done and, and get success and, and achieve goals. And at the, often at the expense of the people in the team, although mm -hmm. I could lead and inspire the team, I would often hurt them. They, it would be really quite brutal at times, mm. getting the job done. And um, I kept on colliding with this sort of sense of shame. You know, while we'd done the job, I'd be getting applause for having led a team to a fantastic place, and I'd be feeling awful because of what I'd done to make it happen, or what I felt had made it into the shame. So in the end, I, I've, uh, I've sort of changed career. I said, I, I can't trust myself to be a boss. And now I'm getting a different kind of um, pain altogether. It's like, I'm, I am not the boss. I've actively chosen not to be the mm. boss of where I am at the moment. I'm working as a therapist uh, in a team. And but Isn't that a cop-out in a way? Because what you decided to do, and that's fair enough, you changed your career. Mm -hmm. But can't you be a boss and a good boss, being a type eight? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Like yeah. Maybe Lynn can come in. Uh... I, I, I really resonate with what's been said there, and I've taken a different path. I'm, I'm a chief executive in the public sector, and I'm on my third chief exec role. And what I've had to do, because anger, the thing that you haven't mentioned that I have always been very much aware of is i very quick to get angry. I think I'm just speaking it as it is. Everyone else thinks they've been completely raised out by me because, and I'm like, oh, I was just telling you how it is. But they've kind of gone away feeling completely polaxed by the energy and the aggression. It wasn't conscious aggression, but it's received as such. What I've had to do, I found the Enneagram 25 years ago 
And at our best, eights are servant leaders. We move to two, so we're able to serve. We understand that people are important. Um, And I've had to consciously work at that, yes, getting the task done. Because we can see how to do it, you see. We've got this laser beam and we can see the big picture. And it's just like, you just look at a situation, it's like, yeah, that's where we go. And you just assume everyone else can do that. And that was the revelation for me of the Enneagram. Understanding there are eight other ways of seeing the world that are not mine. And actually, this was the really hard thing for me as an eight. They're equally as valid because we're always right. In our shadow or our worst, we're right. And nine times out of ten, we we tend to get it right. So my work has been very much how do I get into the servant leadership style, which is saying I am here to serve a higher purpose, which brings in the spiritual Mm. dimension of the Enneagram and putting all of that energy, that focus, that drive into higher order than just getting my own ego needs met. But I think rage, impatience, anger, wanting people to have done it, we're so fast as well. We, we do things very quickly, very immediately. We come from the gut. Mm. We're very intuitive. So it's not all bad, no. <laughs> although we are the bad boys of the Enneagram. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we're all so fun. <laughs> yeah, you see, my, my approach to that is... is I've taken a different approach to that change, and, and and my approach is the fact that you talked about the two, the eight's relationship with the two. I very much deny. Denied... Just explain to people that don't know. So, two is obviously another type of the uh, of the enneagram, and that's known as the helper. helper. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so people and know. It's, yeah. it's the soul child of the of the eight, where the okay. eight comes from. And I I very much have come to realise that I denied my two, uh, my my my. I, I, I guess what I didn't want to do, by, by denying my two, what it meant was I didn't want to take the risk of connecting emotionally, being vulnerable with another. Okay, I needed to be in charge of my relationship with the other, whoever I was with. And um, I didn't want the risk of being a servant helper was, was, was uh, an awful thought to me in, in, the, in that role. And I've come to learn in a, in a different way by, by becoming a, a training as a therapist now for yeah. 10 years working as a therapist. I've learned, I guess, a, a, to, be, to, be, to be in that role, um, but, but with connection with my heart. I've, I've come to terms with my fear of my vulnerability when mm. I'm emotionally connected to somebody. That's a big step, isn't it? Yes. And I don't think I could have done that if I hadn't become a therapist either. I think I needed to get out of the business environment and look very similar to Phil and try a different way of being, you know, move into a different way of being. And the big thing that's come for me is um, I want to be of service. It, that's that's and and the challenge now is well what does that mean in everyday life practically how do you do that and I think that's that's come from re- reconnecting with my heart and what's important to me um, I've found a great joy in being with children I've never had children I've always concentrated on career and independence and kids would kind of like be a problem with that balancing that Um, And I've found a great joy in spending time with children Um, and I've got involved with a charity now that is about helping children and that has been absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful and really helped with the heart connection Um, and that sense of being able to be open um, to the feelings of joy and some sadness because some of these children that we work with have difficulties and being have, having the courage to sit in that emotion mm. and not push it away because one of the things I've found as an eight I find the most difficult was sitting with love, sitting with people that love me. Um, and you know, a lot of the spiritual retreats and the work that I've done on myself over the years, I have found it quite hard to be in a room with people that are basically loving me. Mm. Uh, it's almost burnt. It's almost felt so like it's a physical hard burning. For, it, it was hard for you to respond to that yourself. Just to be there, never mind respond. Mm. Just actually be in the room okay. with it. It's very inte- You know, it's it, it's got easier as I've progressed, but I'm I'm very aware of it. Very aware of it. Yeah. So for people that are watching that don't know much about the enneagram or anything about it, and um, think they may be a type eight, what other th- clues would they look for in terms of the beginning, if you like, of a 
investigation if they're interested. Uh, I think it's that needing to be strong, yeah. which is, it's as if it's compulsive. You feel that you have to be strong. You hide that vulnerable inner child away. At some point in our lives, we just felt we were on our own, we had to do it, we were the ones who were responsible, and it was down to us. Yeah. And I think that's a huge uh, feeling. I also think the thing that really made me understand my eightness is I can't bear people telling lies around me. There is something about truth yeah. and justice and it's almost like you will put yourself right out there on a limb to make sure that the underdog is, is being protected. Yeah. We're very protective of the underdog. And the other thing for me was the compulsive confronting. Yeah. It's almost like you can't help yourself. <laughs> Something happens. So talk more about you, that, how that well, happened. I, I've, I've got an anecdote. On a train in South London and a gang of youths slashing the seats, everyone else moves to the other end. Before I even think about it, and yes, I am a teacher, I started out life as a teacher, um, put that knife away, stop <laughs> doing that. It's only when they turn around that I realise the danger that I'd put myself in but I didn't get to that until a lot later in the moment it's almost like you see something wrong or some injustice and you just try and sort it out yeah. or you step in and it's almost a compulsive so what happened just to well that story. they did actually I got off nobody came they they stopped Actually, they yeah. stopped huh. because I think there's an authority in an eight um, that people often respond to. They did get off the train behind me and they stopped what they were doing and they sat down yeah. and they looked a bit sheepish. Um, and then they followed me off the train, but they didn't harm me in any yeah. way. But when I thought about when I got in, I was yeah. shaking from head to foot. But it didn't stop me at the time. There, there is nothing between the event and the, do and the doing. It's like... So it's there. not a conscious thing of your thinking, I'm being courageous. No. It's wow. just, it's a compulsive, you have to, because yeah. you feel that's right. Yes. That's what I meant about the yeah. programming. It's yes. so automatic, you don't even realise you're doing it. Mm. And I've certainly uh, never backed away from a fight, particularly if I think about my work context, if one of my team is having a hard time or has been badly treated by somebody, um, particularly if they're outside the department, I would wade in. I would not hesitate and wade in to protect them. Loyalty is really important. I feel very loyal to the people that worked for me. I feel very loyal to my clients now. But I expect that loyalty in return. So there's a kind of a double issue. Loyalty is really important along with the truth and the courage. Um, but it's not a conscious thing, or it wasn't a conscious thing at, um, at the time. Um, but that's another common value, I think, for AIDS. Um, and injustice, I mean, the, I cannot tell you the number of campaigns that I've got involved in, uh, right from Greenham Common many years yeah. ago, right yeah. the way through yeah. now, you know, um, it, it, the internet's brilliant because you can sit and do a petition, sign a petition and write a letter <laughs> to your MP almost automatically. Well, I'm there doing it, you know, I'm venting, venting my um, dis, dis, discomfort or, or anger at the injustice that I see. Yeah. But I'm aware, the difference is now, I'm oh, really man. conscious that I'm doing it and I'm choosing. Yes, There's is. a space that comes up, that develops, and you think, OK, do I really want to react to this? And then I think, oh, do I not? Do, what do I choose? And I think the other big part of recognising your innate is the amount of effort you put into something. I used to go through doors at work... Apparently, and people would go, we always know when you're coming through a door because the door bangs open because it was all about putting too much efforting into something. And it's just something simple like opening a door, but it can also be something complicated like restructuring a department so I can work, you know, 18-hour days or would work 18-hour days to get this done and put all this effort in and then come out the other side of the event and crash because I was exhausted mm. and need time to recover. I used to choose jobs and projects that actually reinforce that pattern. So if you feel you're putting a lot of effort into something or trying to achieve something, pushing a rock uphill, that's another key aspect, I think, of an eight. Because you don't stop, you just push harder. <laughs> I'm just looking at some notes that I made just to try and cover all the possible um, um, clues. I've wrote down... 
can't stand being used or manipulated. Is oh, that yeah. something? Oh, yeah. 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 And we can smell it a mile yeah. off. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can feel it. You know when somebody's got that energy. Yeah. Even when others can't. And sometimes that's where we seem to be vengeful or having personality conflicts. Yes. But yeah. we know it's there. You can you can just and sense it. Jerk your chain, you just yeah, know you it. just know yeah. it. Yeah. I also wrote down making decisions is not difficult. Oh, no. And don't bother me with the facts. I'll do it on my gut, thank you very much. The number of times I've said that in my business career, don't confuse me with information. My gut's telling me what to do. Yeah. If anything, we make them too quickly sometimes. Yeah. That can be a weakness. <laughs> self re self reliance is important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the thing about working hard. Like excitement and stimulation. Yeah, that's a, ki that's a killer, that one. That need for intensity. Um... I'll give you an anecdote. My cat went missing a couple of weeks ago and she was gone so nearly 48 hours and it was double guilt because we'd been away, came back. And I was, oh, the cat's gone. She's, that's it. She's been run over. We're never going to see her again. Husband, who's a nine with a very positive outlook, oh, she just got trapped somewhere. But I was having this kind of real emotional response to the fact that the cat was missing. And I put so much into this emotional response and she walked through the door. Uh, 10 o'clock the following night um, and he said see she's just trapped somewhere and I'd post but I'd invested so much emotion intensity in imagining this cat gone and the feeling of loss around this cat um, and for me that was a sign of how important she was to me that yeah. intensity yeah we haven't mentioned the word lost I mean okay. that's one of the things we we lost almost for everything my childhood memories are, have always been told, enough's enough now, Lynn. Is enough never enough mm. for you? Enough's enough, because my mum's an I. Um, so there's something about enough is never enough for us. Mm. And, and we have such a lust for experience, mm. for I'm an eight with a seven wing as well. So, so that constant keeping options open, trying things out. And my energy is boundless. I can, I'm never ill very very rarely and it just seems to keep coming and coming and I've got the boredom threshold of about two minutes um, and just love being stimulated um, the intensity can be exciting but it, I'm married to a nine and I spent the first few years sort of prodding so you're both married to nine yeah. that's interesting prodding <laughs> to make sure there was somebody home yes because come on come out there and meet me meet me you know because mm -hmm. if you're not doing that you don't care and there yeah. is there is a, a sort of pathetic side of that. It isn't just about strength. It's actually, there's something in there that's saying, come and meet me. As yeah. an eight woman, I also learned why I scare people because people are, used yeah. to be very scared of me and I never got why. And there was something for me about needing people who can meet me. I, I love it when somebody stands up to me yeah. and I can actually let my guard down and not have to fight back. But most people are terrified of eights because we tend to keep up in the ante. Mm. But when, as we get more healthy, we want to be met, or I want to be met, by somebody who can hold their ground and, and yeah. just... Yeah. And well, that, speak the truth. And speak, yeah. speak the truth. I think yeah. that's I, another I, important... I, I, when I... When in the commercial world, I, I would consciously employ department heads who could push against me. Mm. So, Phil... No, you're seeing it wrong, you're completely wrong, and, and they'd fight me. They'd, they'd be happy telling me to my face a lot of rubbish because what would happen if I was um, looking, uh, working with the technicians, I would scare them. Yeah. Mm. I would freeze them. Yeah. And, I, I, and, and I, I couldn't communicate like that. So I would consciously recruit people to run departments who could fight me and, and could work with in, in a more heartfelt way, in a more uh, subtle way. But you see, isn't there a difference between fighting you and standing up to you? No, not for me. I mean, there is. Okay. I, I, accept, I accept there is. But for me, no, if, if you're pushing against me, we're having a fight. I enjoy that. The fight is yeah. not a negative statement. Yeah. Yeah. For me. You see, that's very interesting because I said at the beginning of the programme that for me, type 8s have always been very challenging, especially in the business arena. And I found, because that's one of the things that I, I've done um, in my life is since I discovered the Enneagram, people that I find hard to get on with, I kind of did a bit of research and I work out what I think their Enneagram type yeah. is. In a way, it doesn't matter if I get it, always get it right or not, 
I get enough clues somehow, and then I, I feel I understand them more. And I've found with type eights that the best way for me to deal with them is I have to prepare myself somehow, because for me, just, just to go straight in yeah. and have a fight is not Sorry. natural. So it's like, I'm not going in to have a fight, but I'm going in prepared to be strong yeah. and hold my ground. That's how yeah. I do it. And I think that's probably something that a lot of people have to do with type eights because it doesn't come naturally. Yeah. This, you're in their face to, for them to come back and be in your face. Yeah. It's, it's something you build up to or you learn or it's something you acquire. And my, my preparation as an eight is, is in a complete the service of a completely different dynamic. My preparation as an eight is because I know people look to me as a leader, people will follow what I say, I've got to be really careful what I say. Okay, and I don't want people leading. I don't want to make a quick decision if it's not properly informed. So I, I would go to, in, in any realm speak, I'd go to my five. I would do an awful lot of research mm -hmm. to avoid the shame I felt of making a mistake. I didn't want to lead people in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So I would do an awful lot of work to protect that. That's, that's what my preparation would be about, would be to pre protect myself from the shame of taking people in the wrong direction. Because they'd follow me. People, the people I worked with would tend to follow me wherever I, I went. And that's a big responsibility. As, as I listen to the three of you, the, the kind of the feeling I'm getting is that you haven't necessarily fundamentally changed yourselves, but you've refined yourselves and you've used your basic energy, personality, whatever we call it, in a more intelligent way. Would you, would you agree with that or I, do you want to I comment think, on that? I think that's so. Because when I first discovered I was eight, I didn't want to be an eight. Um, and I rejected it, but I, now I'm glad I'm an eight. It's as if I can I can celebrate the good things of me and have completely toned down the other aspects. So yes, I think that trying to be more intelligent, having choice, having space, being conscious about the impact. I've used the Enneagram in three organisations in which I've been the chief executive, and it's very similar to what Phil was saying. It was like, well, if you want to share in this, you'll find out about me because I really don't want to be these negative things, and I can find out about you. And what I discovered is people did make stands, and they did say to me, we can prepare for you now, Lynn. We get that it's not mal malicious. We get that it's not intentional. But it's exactly what you said. We can prepare because we understand the fabric of the eight and how we can come and make a stand with you. And and I I saw teams change. My relationships with the senior team improved drastically because we were all consciously using the eight and coming to very high performance as a result of that. Was this toning down hard for you? There's a part of it that was very difficult because there's almost, like, you can get high on some of this. Um, the intensity, the the relief of a good fight, you know, of a... Okay, a, this, this, yeah, so, <laughs> so a good it's, fight, it's something that brings you relief. It's a li I've never aliveness. I've thought of that. No, it's yeah. aliveness. Mm. And ah. it gets the tension out of your system. It's physical. There's, it's there's a physical feeling. It's like yeah. after a game. I'm 64. I'm an eight, so I'm not playing golf. I'm playing squash. Uh, I guess golf as a game is far too low intensity for me. Yes. I get. I don't get anything back from golf. Yeah. And it's like that intensity is there. And after a game of squash, I, I, I'm empty. And so, that's, so just to understand you more, so when you appear to be having a fight with somebody, and I'm not saying you do this now, the three of you, but when you did, it was like almost a similar feeling after you've had a game of squash or whatever yeah. sports you guys yeah. do. It's a like relief and that relaxation you can have after mm -hmm. having a good run or something. It's a discharge of energy. Yeah. Discharge, and yeah. what I found as well is um, I had no problem finding the words to wound. Mm. Um, yeah. I, 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 even my father, when he was alive, used to say to me, um, and he's an, he was an eight, um, your your command of of, of language when you you're, when the red mist is down and the way you speak and speak and put sentences together to wound i didn't i was i wasn't even aware that i was doing it it would just come i mean i pray i never do it again but um i i know that capacity that potential is there and what for me has worked is self reflection a lot of five 
now I, I, I go into you know the point the the point of disintegration for eights is is if you get really stressed is you can withdraw to kind of strategize and work out what's going on and work out a strategy for how you're going to come back into the game um, for me uh, a lot of self reflection reading meditation has helped me tremendously to create that space um, and I don't consider it to be fights anymore I'm looking for a win-win-win a win for me a win for the other person and a win for the universe and that was the big shift for me to change that mm. perspective that's how I recognized I could let go of that need to discharge that energy and always win and always be on top and for me the service piece um, is uh, is about leading people from behind. That's why I'm a therapist and, and, and a coach. It's about helping others to become self-leaders. That's how I serve. And if they can take something from me and my experiences of training and being a leader in, in, in previous jobs, then that's how I discharge that now. That's how I discharge that energy. And it's just a much healthier, balanced and integrated place to be, I have to say. But I do know it's there. I do know that if at any point I'm not having a particularly good day and somebody crosses me, I know I have the potential to lash out. So I know that Sandra Matry in one of her books, I think I showed earlier, she talks about the animal soul being very basic yeah. in the type yeah. 8. And you have this animal side. It's like when you were saying... And, in the tube train with the guy with a knife, it's like yeah. you go out there and you pounce without thinking. Mm. And you're saying that never really goes. You no. just understand it more and it's more yeah. in balance. And you have choice. If you really work with the Enneagram and other things, particularly the Enneagram, you create freedom for yourself to choose to, to respond in a different way. And for mm. me, that was the blessing. That was the mm. blessing. <laughs> For me, the, 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 one of the gifts of the eight is this huge availability of energy and, mm. and, and, and strength and durability. And what I, the way I see that is that I used to direct that outwards into my defences, mm. into the world, into structure. And what I've learned is, to, is if I can direct that inwards and, and nourish my heart, which I used to deny, yeah. um, I, I'm more whole, I, I'm safer. I, I don't act out. Uh, in the same way at all, I can still feel um, a rush sometimes when when I when I see um, something going wrong, and it's something going wrong. I, I feel like it's still it's my responsibility. Whatever's going wrong, I have a responsibility to do something about that. I still feel the pull of that, and it's mm. uh, learning that it's not my it's not all my business. I, I can't no. do everything I'm, I'm pulled to do. Is is um, is something I have to accept, and that's why I liked I liked. Um, I was really drawn to that book, Facets of Unity. That's that's why that talks about that struggle for an eight. About yeah, mm. like, for me, I am, I do get a real sense of what Alice talks about there. And the, I, I do feel I'm connected with anything. In my when I'm connected, I am connected to everything. To the universe. Yeah. To, to the universe. I, I I understand that. So how, how, how does that feel, Phil? So you you've got that's the two dynamics going on. You've got yeah. you haven't lost your your animal soul contact, if you like, and yet you have this feeling that you're, you're widely connected. How, how, how does that balance feel in you? It just brings me joy now. It doesn't, it doesn't bring uh, the red mist anymore. Mm. It just brings... Uh, I, I, it just nourishes me. Mm. That, 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 that just rewiring of the program mm. slightly to, to feed the energy into my heart before I engage my head and do something it's a great, that really brings joy it's a kind of equanimity I think the word equanimity comes up for me as I've because one of the things that really worked for me is training as a spiritual healer mm. and and being able to learn how to manage energy um, so that all this energy that was coming through me realizing I could channel it I didn't have to kind of do something with it and and also presencing, just literally the feeling my legs, my feet and sensing into that body. And there's a calmness and an equanimity and a sense of expansiveness mm. that absorbs the energy in a way that it isn't, the intensity isn't coming out through the personality into doing. Mm. But it, it's taken me years and years mm. to know how to be 
um, I really was a human doing. And what were some of the key steps that helped you on that uh, For that me, journey? meditation was hard for me, head meditation. I yeah. was a Theravadan Buddhist for 11 years and I never really got it. It was, it was feeling, I had a living daylight experience where that energy was, was everywhere. So what's a living daylight when experience? When I just got filled with light and oneness and unity, could just feel I was part of the whole universe. And, and I trained as a spiritual healer. For, mm. with the Federation of Spiritual Healers and just found that helped me to ground myself mm. in whole new ways. So energetic work and um, body work, which I will avoid really yeah. if I can, actually, <laughs> um, but it has the most kundalini work. It has the most mm. powerful impacts on me, but I'll avoid it like anything. Yes. I have to yes, really absolutely. work yeah. hard yeah. Just to be mm. in my body. To give Despite control being, over to someone, yeah. to give your body physically over to somebody yeah. con to control, as I would <laughs> characterise it as an eight, is getting somebody to do body work on me physically is a big stretch. It's, it's a, I have to go into myself now. Yeah. Uh, yes. Really yeah. consciously reconnect to allow myself yeah. not to, to, to tense. It's interesting because we are body types, but it's, you know, the one thing that... I think the three of us would also have got in common is don't want to do this. I mean, I've just restarted yoga after many years because I just couldn't cope with it. And I recognised why and understood why. Um, but I think it's a sign of I'm giving myself a little pat on the back that I've actually managed to sustain going to yoga. And I think the other thing I've learned is at the core for us, our biggest fear is fear of being controlled. And I recognised that that's a double bind. My fear of being controlled has controlled mm. me all my life. And the minute I realised that, that, it started to fall away and dissipate, and that sense of connection and oneness started to, to come much stronger. Um, because And I laughed. I actually laughed when I, when I was on a retreat and this came out. I actually started giggling because it really is very silly, if you think about it, to get caught up in that kind of delusion or illusion. Um, but I found that very helpful. Mm. Mm. The whole issue of vulnerability for me was a, was a big issue. It sort of really was a smack in the face for me when I realised that for me to be defending all the time, making things right, putting, sorting out things that were being from the outside that were, were causing wrongness, meant that I had to perceive myself as a victim. Mm. And I, I, that, for me, was a big part of the unravelling yeah. of my connection mm. to that, because I'm not a victim. But, but to, to be acting like I'm defending against the damage you can do me, mm. okay, means that yeah. I have to believe I'm a victim. Yeah. And, and that, for me, was a huge letting go of, I know I'm not a victim. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. It's letting go of the story. Yeah. You know, it's... A so the when you story say of who you are. go the story, talk more about that. Well, it's the victim thing, isn't it? Um, you know, in my case, I could talk about, you know, um, a very happy childhood in lots of ways, but then aspects of feeling as the eldest that I was respons felt very responsible and had to get out there and prove myself. And, you know, somehow there's this kind of story that you attach mm. to why you are who you are. Um, and it's a pile of crap to use a very eight phrase. <laughs> um, and if you can learn to let go of that and accept letting go of that and step into that space where you it's unknown. If you're not this, then who are you? And stepping into that space and being courageous enough and being vulnerable enough to explore who are you? And the answer is presence. And once you can do that, um, and whatever type on the Enneagram you are, it just brings such freedom and joy and love and deep, for me, deep stillness. It's characterised by, for me by a completely deep stillness. It's the complete opposite of what you're doing. If you're operating from the, the eight personality type, the last thing you are is still. <laughs> I think that's right. And we tend to be big body types. Yeah. Not, I mean, but we, you know, and, and clearly the three of us are, because we're carrying the weight of the world. I think part of the story I really identify, and I'm the yeah. eldest, with with that yeah. being so responsible, being so strong. It's down to us, mm -hmm. and and 
and I know I pad myself out in order to kind of be able to carry that because I feel stronger. And letting go of that in being vulnerable, beginning to realise that actually you're not right all the time, you can't control it all, you can't carry the weight of the world on your shoulder. I mean, it's just silly. Mm. But we really believe mm. that. Mm. It, and, and it's you what... see, some people, um, Lynn, would say that being vulnerable when you're a CEO of a big company, is a pretty difficult thing to do. And, and it is. So um, how do you find that balance? I had to go into therapy to be able to... I had an experience of my usual ways not working and feeling very vulnerable, and I hid it, so I went into therapy to do that. And then what I realised is as long as I'm authentic... For me, it was the big issue about vulnerability and authenticness and realising that the more... If I'd made a mistake, instead of, like, blustering my way through it, that I actually went out to the staff and said, you know, I think I got that wrong. How can we do that? expecting that they would react against me I got the opposite effect and lead I mean the leadership theory now is right up into authentic leadership and self-awareness but in those days I'm talking 20 years ago it wasn't Mm. but I gradually got an experience that as I showed those parts of myself that were more uncertain less sure I really got I didn't have to know everything all the time that people responded very well. Now, if I'd been incompetent or I was saying I, I got it wrong all the time, I think it would have been a different reaction. But this was really showing I was authentically saying, I don't know how to do this or how can we do that? I so, might have so gone into people... my office afterwards and cried my eyes out or shaked and thinking, mm. I can't believe I just did that. I can't believe I just did that. But it was just staying with it. So people responded in a positive way to very, your honesty. Very to the sense that this is honest, this is real, because with an eight, whatever, what you see is what you get. Um, But I don't underestimate the challenges because there are pressures on you from your board, from targets, around performance. But my sense is if you're on this journey of self-awareness and wanting to get out of the traps of the eightness or any type, then staying with this honesty and truth and we're in this together instead of I'm here on my own was there a point for you like both the other two guys they changed their careers was there a point with you because you talked to you worked as a spiritual healer you uh trained in therapy um was there a point where you thought well maybe this isn't my vocation to be to be a big boss if you like It's really interesting. I have spent my life saying I'm going to leave. So I'm an ordained interfaith minister. So I I constantly do my spiritual work by training. And then when I get to the end of that training, I realise I want to stay where Mm. I am. Um, I even wanted to be a nun at one time. And and, and the novice novice mistress... (laughs) Well, they wouldn't have me anyway. But the novice (laughs) mistress said, no, your vocation... I'm in further education... Um, mm. So I've been a principal of a college, a uh, national college. So my true vocation professionally is serving students for second chance and further education. So so there's a kind of bit of a duality with me. I'm always going to leave, but actually business and leadership is as much my spiritual path, I think, as mm. going out into a different arena. Mm. Having said that, I've just moved to Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we have about 10 minutes left. I'd like to use this effectively as we can, and I am particularly interested, and we've done a lot on this already, but the clues that people watching can pick up of how to move forward in terms of they maybe identify themselves as a type 8 and they like and they see that they're stuck in their patterns, the practical things that they can do in their own way, everyone has their own path in their own way, of moving forward to the more the potential of the type 8. Um, well, a lot of, I mean, the books you've talked about, there's a lot of stuff out there about the, you know, the Enneagram. There's um, all your programmes on in terms of trying to bring it to life. I think the other thing for an eight that's a real growth point is asking for help. Eights don't ask for help. And that's been the big one of the biggest reliefs for me. So if you are watching and you're an eight, 
that's going to be a real challenge. Asking for help, seeking someone out that you can talk to, uh, going into therapy, which I did as well some years ago, that was a huge thing to do um, because it meant asking for help, paying for help and admitting that there was something not quite right, not, something wasn't working well. Um, so I, I think that's the one, uh, one I, w I, would, I would suggest, get, get some help. Get, find people that you do trust, whose wisdom you trust, and talk to them. Take time out to think about what it is you want. Take some quiet time. Um, there's plenty of retreats and things that people could do as a starting point. And just be still for a bit and see what comes. It's very scary, very scary as an eight, but I think that's a key part of it. Certainly one of the things for me... Um when I discovered my Enneagram type, was very much understanding other people. So I was yes. intrigued and I, yes. once I studied what I was, I wanted to read about everybody else and work out how they, how they worked as yeah. human beings and what their difficulties were. And mm. as I said earlier, how I could relate better with them. And I think that's probably for you guys as well, quite an important step to really understand how other people function. Yes. I think there's a note of caution with that, that you don't um, nominalise somebody and say, oh, you're a four and you're a six and you're a three, and kind of they become the number. We are not the numbers. Um, so, But I certainly in terms of my training as a therapist, it's helped me understand other people's maps of the world when they walk through the door, what might their key drivers might be, what the focus might be. Um, and it's given me, gave me com a huge amount of compassion, which I think is another thing, getting in touch with that heart mm -hmm. side. I mean, that, that was quite painful. When that, get, when that arose, when that started to bloom, that sense of f f pain that you felt for other people's pain, um, again, that was something I had to get used to sitting with and not pushing away, um, particularly as I was training you know, to be a therapist. So I think that's that's one of the key aspects that comes with it. Coming with understanding and awareness of other people, for me, has also brought out compassion. I'd like to pick up on that. I think actually listening to music that makes you cry. Oh. You know, finding things that that actually you can feel in your heart. Because at, yeah. one of our shadow sides is we can perhaps cut off okay. too quickly and easily. So I think heartfelt practices, you know, that don't have to be complicated, just things that make you cry, mm. things that make you feel connected to others, things that make you realise, because the, people are not objects, mm. that they have their own way of being, that there is something in us that needs to respond mm. to where they are and how they are. Um, I think that's a really important Maybe element. Do that for me too. Mm. Yes, yeah, the, 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 the Sufi says often, the, we often talk about this ocean of tears, yeah. and often I found in, in the early days when I started to meditate, I found that for me to, to reconnect with my body, I would go through a layer of tears mm. before I would connect every meditation, and, and, and uh, it was... Um, a lot of sadness to process, mm. a lot of heart to, to, to process uh, in that. And I, and I guess the other the, the, the tip that was most useful for me in the early days was that when I would act out, when I would respond and start an argument, start a fight, um, I, I, I learned what I call my skiing technique. I'm fr afraid of heights, so I learned to ski. And going down a black slope, the best way to ski is to th put your weight down the steepest part of the slope, and then your skis work and you're safe. But that's every instinct of my body was saying, cling back onto the snow and, and of course your, ski, your skis get light and you're all over the place. So the skiing technique is whenever every part of me says, okay, I'm going to fight now, that's a call for a fight. Every time I felt that, I came to recognise that and I, did, I would do the opposite. I would just contact my heart and it bought, that's how I bought myself the time. Mm. To, so I, I, it's not that I dishonoured that, that, that red energy in me, but I, I honoured a different part of myself and, and gave it time to to join up, so I, I, I wouldn't get lost mm. again in a, in a fight. Or and that was really scary, mm. scary, scary, scary. But I wrote down um, a little bit of research from the Enneagram books, and I wrote down some well-known people who were Type Eight. So 
just thought oh. it's always interesting for people. Um, fun enough, quite a few of them are dead now. Um, uh, <laughs> Golda Meyer, mm -hmm. uh -huh. John Wayne, I thought was really amusing. Uh, Martin Luther King, very yeah. different from John Wayne. Um, Nelson Mandela, yes. Charles de Gaulle, <laughs> Bette Midler, and the one that made me really laugh was Sarah Ferguson. I never oh, sort of really? thought yeah, of, yeah. Well, actually, I'm not yeah. saying it's definitely true, but that was in one of the books. Just <laughs> yeah. yeah. give people a kind of a feel for some personalities who are tired yeah. fates. Yes. Mm -hmm. The very first Enneagram workshop I went on, they went round the Enneagram and said, oh, Mother, um, um, Mother Teresa Kennedy. And then they came to the end and they went, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there was often in the early days that, that the eight was the, the sort of really negative figure. Yeah. And I think bringing out that there are very positive eights yes. whose leadership can be quite amazing um, yeah. is great. <laughs> in my discussions on the Enneagram, various groups, um, the I think it might be an English trait. The English have a tendency to focus on what's wrong and what needs fixing. And I think, you know, in, in the interests of balance, there are gifts that the eights bring, as there are gifts that every Enneotype bring. And I think um, anyone watching this, thinking about, or oh, looking to diagnose themselves from the negatives, take, give yourself a break and also look at some of the positive things you bring to the world. Because if not, you can end up... <laughs> in a very dark and gloomy place if you don't, you know, if you're just beginning to understand this work and want to explore it more, there are gifts. I think that's right. And the most liberating thing for me in the very early days of discovering the Enneagram was that the eight was no better or no worse yeah. than any other type which was, yes. it was such a relief to me mm. because I think we do harbour that we are the worst type. Mm. We really are bad on, on some level. So I think that, that notion that we're no better but we're certainly no worse was a complete liberation mm. for me. Well, one thing I wrote down, I just remembered, uh, that I picked up from one of the books, was that the uh, when you were speaking, mm. uh, uh, type eights have the power to inspire others to be heroic. Yeah. Which in a kind yeah. ties in what you're saying. It's to have yeah. this this leadership quality is there, and others will follow and be inspired. Mm. If you're in your courage and your yeah. innocence and your vulnerability, somehow others will follow. And that's my deepest prayer for my clients that the work when working with them, that they feel inspired to face the difficulties that they're dealing with, um, and the courage to change. Mm -hmm. OK, we're going to have to uh, finish there, but I want to first thank you very much for coming along and you. sharing yourselves. I think it's been a very helpful programme and a very interesting programme as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to just do a little plug again for these books, which we all, uh, we all looked at and decided it was probably good to, uh, good to mention. So it's the Enneagram Made Easy again, which is a very basic one, but if you know nothing about the Enneagram, it's a good starting point. It has some cartoons there also to help help you identify your type. And then going into more detail is the uh, wisdom of the Enneagram, which isn't too complicated, but also starts on the potential of the Enneagram types as well. Obviously these books cover all the nine types. And then the Sandra's Matry, one of her books, The Spiritual Dimensions of the Enneagram, looks in more detail at the spiritual side and the potential. And probably the, the hardest read, but if you wanted to stick with it, the most potential, describes the potential, the best of the Enneagram, is Facets of Unity by A.H. Almas. So thanks again to my guests. Thank you. And thank you for watching Conscious TV and this Enneagram series. We've done most of the types now, so if you feel you're not a type 8 and you want to know more about the other types, then you need to look at the Conscious TV uh, website and find the other programmes. So, and I hope we uh, see you again soon, Conscious TV. Goodbye.